Nat was not casting himself as the Messiah, but typing his life after the models he knew. Sometimes God rewarded prophets with victory, but evil always rose up against faithfulness, at least until the end of the world. Why precisely should Nat expect this evil world to permit him to live when the world had crushed so many virtuous prophets before him? If the atheistic Gray was troubled by this line of inquiry, he did not say so. But it is a question that has troubled the memory of Nat since 1831, and it is a question that should trouble us still. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event presented by American Ancestors, Boston Public Library, Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and GBH Forum Network. I'm Margaret Talkett, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors, the creator and a producer of this book talk series. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us tonight in the land of history, looking at a decisive event in 19th century America, the 1831 rebellion of Nat Turner, his visions, and the experience of enslaved peoples and landowners in Southampton County, Virginia. Now, for some background information on our guest speakers, I turn you over to my partners in this night's presentation, the Boston Public Library and Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. Kristen, over to you. Thank you, Margaret. And from the Boston Public Library, welcome everyone. I'm Kristen Mati, a programs librarian here at the Central Library. We're delighted to be in partnership with American Ancestors, the GBH Forum Network, and the Fall Ford Hart Hall Forum on tonight's program with professors Greg Downs and Vincent Brown. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I have the honor this evening of sharing a little bit about this evening's featured authors. Gregory P. Downs is professor of history at the University of California at Davis. He is the author of three books on the Civil War era and a book of short stories, as well as many op-eds, for leading newspapers. He is the co-editor of the Journal of the Civil War Era. Downs assisted in the completion of Nat Turner Black Prophet, which represents the research of Anthony Tony E. K. Dr. K taught history at Pennsylvania State University and was the vice president of scholarly programs at the National Humanities Center. Kay was an influential scholar of Atlantic slavery and American history and the author of a prior well-regarded history of enslaved people and their understanding of space and place, joining places, slave neighborhoods in the Old South. He also served as an associate editor of the Journal of the Civil War Era and was an editor of the Freedmen and Southern Society Project. Now to tell us about tonight's moderator, Susan, over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good evening. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and I join Margaret and Kristen in welcoming you to this evening's program. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to this evening's moderator, Vincent Brown. Vincent Brown is the Charles Warren Professor of American History and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. He teaches courses in Atlantic history, African di diaspora studies, and the history of slavery in the Americas. Brown is the author of The Reaper's Garden, Death and Power in the World of Atlantic Slavery and Tacky's Revolt, The Story of an Atlantic Slave War. And he's the producer of Hervokvitz at the Heart of Blackness, an audiovisual documentary broadcast on the PBS series Independent Lens, and the short video series The Bigger Picture for PBS Digital Studios. He is also on the Scholars Council for American Ancestors' 10 Million Names Project. We'll hear from Professor Brown in the second half of our program. And it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Professor Downs. Professor Downs, take it away. All right. Well, thank you all so much. I'm so excited to be here and honored to be uh, in, uh, in the company of, of Vince, one of the leading scholars of American, of U.S. history and of global history and of the history of enslaved people. And I'm also really appreciative of all the help of the people who brought this together, Margaret, Susan, Kristen, Federique, and others. 
and American Ancestors, WGBH, Suffolk University, and the Boston Public Library. And I'm honored to be here, I believe, uh, in the virtual presence of uh, some people who are uh, dear to me and even more dear to the person who's the, the lead author of this book, the late Tony Kay. And so I believe that um, his, uh, his wife, his widow, Melissa, is here, and his mom, Ellen, and possibly his brother, Chip. So I'm going to start with the dis discussion of the unusual way in which this book came to be, um, because it really represents not just Tony's research, but, you know, I hope and believe his vision and, you know, at times his direct language and at other times the way that I tried to put what I understood of his vision in, into words. And I'm here to talk about a book um, that in this unusual way we did together. And it's about um, probably the most famous enslaved rebel in U.S. history, a man named Nat who had been owned by the White Turner family. And we'll talk about his name. I'll talk about his name a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to make some comments here in this time about the book and about Nat and about his life and then look forward to the discussion moderated by eminent Vincent Brown of Harvard. But before I go into the story, I want to talk about the unusual way this book came into being and the sometimes uh, sort of unusual way I'll, I'll answer questions about it. Um, this is an unusual collaboration. There are some collaborative books in history, though not as many as there should be. Um, but this is one where the ultimate author is not the person uh, in front of you. And my happiest wish would be that I could be on the other side of the screen watching him uh, talk about it. This book was the, uh, you know, the love and the inspiration and the perspiration and the ideas and the years of work of, of Tony Kay, who you see pictured here, my friend and an eminent historian, a professor at Penn State University and a director at the National Humanities Center, among many other things. Um, and Tony had in his first work written about the ways that enslaved people's understanding of the world was shaped by their specific view of geography, who, how they decided who could be an ally, who they were suspicious of, what they knew intensely about the world around them and a walk or a ride distance, depending on their access to horses, and also how they made sense of the world beyond those boundaries and those borders. As he finished that book, he was interested in both pursuing that idea, but in a sign of his real intellectual uh, curiosity and range, he also wanted to test it. And he wanted to test it against, uh, you know, something that, you know, he had, he had been asked about uh, to ask whether it fit with this uh, sense of how people understood their relation to the world. And that is the largest, one of the two largest uh, rebellions of enslaved people in the period of the national history of the United States. And he started to work on it from that context. How did geography shape this? And then, as he said in an interview he gave, uh, I started out thinking this would be a small, quick book, using that frame to understand it. But in the more I learned, the longer it got. He said, I really wanted to understand this from his point of view. It's taken me a long time, and I had to dig deep. In that long time, as you'll see, he wrestled with the history of warfare, the history of religion, the history of Methodism, the idea of prophecy in the, in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. But also as he wrestled with those questions, he was diagnosed uh, with, uh, with, with esophageal cancer. And in that period of time, around 2016, he reached out to me to ask if I would be ready to take up the baton if, if he needed that. And so for the next year and a few months, we met in person, we talked on the phone, we emailed, he shared drafts, he talked about the plans that he had, and these were plans that we both hoped I would never have to fulfill. They were contingencies. Um, but in fact, uh, the heartbreak of uh, many of us and to the loss of the field and to the loss of the other forms of the book this could have been, Tony passed away on, on May 14th, 2017. And only days before, he had asked Melissa to send a large batch of electronic files he was hoping to continue to work on, at least before he had to share them with me. And then she sent me boxes of his materials, of pages and pages that he had worked painstakingly through with his, with his you know, recognizable handwriting. And from him, I got thousands of pages and all kinds of senses of his idea and the ways that his idea had changed over time. And also the honor and privilege of trying to think about him and to be in a kind of imagined dialogue with him, even as he was no longer sadly with us. 
And what I saw in there and what Tony had been working to convey to me over the last year is how this book had taken a new direction. As he said in an interview he gave, Tony said, Nat did what he did because he believed it is what God wanted him to do. It took him nine years to finally accept the commands he said he received from the spirit who spoke to the prophets in former times. And he's saying as he's misunderstood by other enslaved people, as he seemed, you know, as they seem confused by him, he says, I have to obey um, this. I have to obey God. So Tony left me a mass of materials on Nat's religious beliefs, his interest in warfare, his generalship, the remembered histories of other rebellions involving black evangelicals in the region, the related evangelically, partly evangelically inspired rebellions in Demerara and Sierra Leone and elsewhere, and on Nat's legacy. And for six years, longer, you know, I, and, and it was a joy to work on it. And I also felt the pull to make sure I finished it so that he could, um, so that it could live out there. Um, it took me about six years to complete this book. And what we have is, as I, as I wrote, it's what I believe is his vision, as much as I could execute it, executed through, um, you know, many words that I wrote based on his and edited, aiming to fulfill the view of the book that he carried to the degree that I can understand it. And in the end, I suggest some ways that he was working that I couldn't pull together in the book, but that give some windows into th other ways that you could approach that or to develop them. And it was a labor of love, a testament to a friend and a way I've, it was convincing myself I was communing with him even after he had left this plane. And I'm glad to discuss this collaboration and questions um, if you'd like. But I want to move on to the story of the book. First, as we move on, I want to say that I've included some images that purport to be of Nat, um, but we don't have any actual images of him. And even the descriptions of him from the time period don't align all that well in a way that would give you a real clear sense of what he looked like. So I think these are useful as ways of understanding how people tried to picture Nat. And it's such a crucial part of how we understand people. And it's also such a difficult part of writing about Nat is that we know so many things about some aspects of his theology and certain days in which he moved and did things. We know so little about this really basic sense of what did it mean to look at him. And you can see here, I named the different people um, that produced each of these images. And as other images come up, be aware that all of these are imagined productions, some by people who are deep sympathizers, some by people who are weary uh, sympathizers, especially Northern abolitionists, and some by people who were deeply fearful or critical of him, um, but all of which are sort of ways of conjuring up a person and they could not, they had not themselves seen. You can see, though, some of the ways that Nat has lived in the imagination since then. The warrior in the upper left corner, um, the inspired man of God in the, in the, in the right side, and a fantastic sketch by, by Charles White. Um, and as a leader of people, of a band, of a small band of, uh, of, of confederates is what they call them, but of collaborators and lieutenants once they went to war. So here's what we know about, about Nat. Um, I mean, some of the things we know. Hopefully there's more than that in the book, too. The key thing people know is that on the afternoon of August 21st, 1831, a Sunday, Nat gathered a small band of collaborators together at a pond near the plantations where they lived. For months, he had been telling them about the visions the Holy Spirit had been showing him over the last nine years, visions that told him it was time to attack the system they all hated, the system of slavery, visions that told him God would be on their side. They had made plans before. He had made plans before and delayed them. But now, whether celestial events, an eclipse, Strange colorations in the sky convinced him, likely caused by a distant hurricane, convinced him that this was at last the signal and the time to act. They brought other collaborators, men Nat quizzed to be certain of their commitment. Together they ate, the other men drank, Nat didn't, um, and they waited for the fall of night and the end of Sabbath. And sometime after midnight, very early on the morning of Monday, August 22, they attacked two houses nearby, houses that belonged to the family that controlled Nat, um, although his, his, his title was held by, by, a very young, by a child at this point, and where he had lived. 
um, killing everyone there, all the white people there, taking weapons and food, recruiting enslaved people to join them. And then they began to march onward across the rural neighborhood of Cross Keys, Virginia, on the southern edge of Southampton County, bordering the North Carolina state line. Um, and as uh, over the course of two days, they grew from a handful of people to more than 40, some estimates as many as 60 or 70, marching from house to house of white people who enslaved people, attacking the white people, men, women, and children, and urging and at times forcing enslaved members to join their band. As they marched, they pursued complex military maneuvers ordered by NAB, dividing, recombining, launching probing attacks, then rushing in, practicing both ambush and frontal assault. In their plan to clear the area of white people who enslaved human beings and to reach the county seat, which propitiously was named Jerusalem, and to capture that county seat and to await God's revelation of what would unfold, of the next stage of the plan that they were acting out to bring into being, whether it would be another military campaign, an establishment of a worldly government, or as Nat increasingly seemed to hope and to fear, Christ's return and the Armageddon promised in Revelation to destroy the world and in the process create a new Jerusalem where men and women lived alongside God the sight of his longing and of his fear, and of the longing and fear of many evangelicals in this period. Along the way, they killed approximately 55 white people with guns, axes, and fence posts, some in battles, some in their beds, skipping some houses, especially, though not exclusively, of relatively poor white people. Um, they went to war not against one or two cruel people, but against a cruel system and the people who upheld it. And Nat denied that the people they first killed, the man and woman who controlled him, the family members who had, um, you know, had passed him along in inheritances and transfers, he denied that they were personally cruel, although he had an overseer he considered cruel. But they, it was enough to say they sustained slavery and profited from it. They were at war against a system. It was one of the largest slave rebellions in U.S. history, matched only by an 1811 rebellion near or New Orleans, and exceeded only by events we don't always classify as rebellions, but that mark the consciousness of the people, white and black, around that. Dozens and hundreds of enslaved people from the region who fled to British lines in the Revolution and the War of 1812, and then donned uniforms and fought against their enslavers. If we consider those rebellions of enslaved people, then the largest in U.S. history would be the 200,000 black men, mostly formerly enslaved, who fought in the U.S. Army in the Civil War, the Army and the Navy in the Civil War, and the women and children who supported them with supplies. After fighting their way to within a few miles of Jerusalem over the long day of August 22nd, they encountered the first organized white militia unit near the gate of a man named Parker and drove them into flight. But as they did, a second group of later mustering militia provided crucial reinforcements and partly broke up Nat's company. First, Nat sought to sustain his strategy of reaching Jerusalem that day, trying to cross a small bridge and to flank Jerusalem from a different side. Seeing that was well guarded, he regrouped at the site of one of the largest plantations in the region near the slave quarters. And he sought to grow from a local rebellion led by many he mostly knew, and including a, you know, at least one recognized woman, into a broader campaign of enslaved people against the system of slavery. And early in the next morning, as the militia had gathered back in Jerusalem for fear of an attack, Nat and his band attacked in the other direction at a nearby plantation, but they were driven back under heavy fire, breaking up, sending most of his band scattering, and Nat back to the area where he had launched the rebellion, near the, plant, the, the farms and plantations that he had lived his life. And over the next days and weeks, people and rumors arrived from surrounding counties, and then officially from Norfolk and Richmond, aiming to white people, aiming to wreak revenge, to slaughter until they had killed their fears. For days, there was widespread murder in Southampton County of enslaved people and some free black people, and sometimes much farther away as fear spread of a broader plot. Then the state militia commanders and local lawyers tried to reassert the authority of the law. White elites organized trials to condemn 18 people to be hung, many others to be sold out of state. But there was still something that had not been resolved for the white people of the area. Where was Nat? 
For two months, he hid his rumors spread of his whereabouts, of him traipsing across the south, even into the north, hiding in the great dismal swamp. But in fact, he said he hid very close to home for two months. And then on October 30th, 1831, Nat surrendered to a white man in the woods near the pond where the rebellion began. And over the next 11 days, Nat spoke repeatedly about the rebellion to white people in the neighborhood, to lawyers in the county seat of Jerusalem, to passersby, and to Thomas Gray, a white lawyer who wrote down what purported to be Nat's words and published them in Nat's Confessions, a book that sold staggering numbers of copies in its time and continues to be read and puzzled over today. In the aftermath, Virginia's legislature, for the last time, seriously considered a plan to end slavery gradually and also expel black people from the state, a plan with genuine support among white Western delegates, but opposition from the overrepresented planters of the eastern part of the state. Instead, the Virginia legislature and soon many Southern state legislatures cracked down on the system of slavery. On the, the crackdown, not on the system of slavery, but the flaws they saw in the revolt. Literacy, religiosity, barring white people from teaching enslaved people to read, regulating black preachers and encouraging white ministers to preach the righteousness of slavery. Although there are many narratives written by enslaved people or their interlocutors, the confessions are startling because they record not just Nat's actions, but his descriptions of a series of visions sent by the Spirit. Visions that directed Nat to carry out his glorious and terrible task. The Spirit spoke to him, revealing the knowledge of the elements, the operation of the tides, the changes of the season. The Spirit, according to the confession, showed Nat white spirits and black spirits engaged in battle as blood flowed in streams. Then it revealed drops of blood on the corn, hieroglyphic characters and numbers, and images of men on the leaves in the woods. The Spirit revealed the true meaning of the constellation in the sky. They were the lights of the Savior hands stretched forth from east to west, even as they were extended on the cross on cavalry. The Spirit told Nat the time was fast approaching when he should take up the yoke that Christ had laid down and fight against the serpent. We can never know for sure when Gray was accurately recording Nat's words and when he wasn't, but we know Nat did not wholly invent these stories. Many other people heard Nat speak of similar visions both before and after his capture. That's the quick story. One that some of you may know well, and others may not know at all. But I want to step back now, no less from what we know about, uh, you know, to, I want to step back a little bit into what we know uh, otherwise about his life. First, his place. Nat was from Southampton County, the red county in the southeast of Virginia, not far from the Chesapeake, but not directly in the Chesapeake and, and with a small river that didn't flow easily in it. In Southside, Virginia, where the tidewater lands that flow into the Chesapeake give to farmland more distant from rich farmland in the southern part of the county where he lived, but more distant from trading networks. It had been a frontier, a place that white Virginians who, needed, who wanted more land for their families moved, including the white Turners, and they forcibly moved enslaved people with them, breaking up families and communities closer to the Chesapeake to move them deeper into the land. And then Turner's claimed uh, at his birth ownership of Nat, of his mother, and of his grandmother. And this area was a place shaped by rebellions in which black people took up arms to fight for freedom. And the Revolutionary War, Methodist and other evangelical black preachers, especially Moses Wilkinson, led women, men, and children to the British lines where the men donned uniforms and fought for the British and their freedom. And Wilkinson would become a church and political leader of this group as they went with the British to New York, to Canada, to Sierra Leone. Slightly farther away in the War of 1812, when the British stayed more concentrated in the Chesapeake and didn't in, invade as deeply into the interior, there were, there were many enslaved people who also ran to British lines then, fought for the British, and fought for their freedom. And then there were rebellions or plotted rebellions led by enslaved people themselves not far away many of which also, like Nats, drew on visions of God's plan for the, for the future, for the end of slavery. One called Gabriel's Rebellion in Richmond in 1800, another in Charleston in 1822, organized by free man of color Denmark Vesey, and other smaller ones in and near Southampton. Thanks to the wonderful scholarship on these subjects, 
And on that, we have a much clearer story of, uh, of, of these rebellions. And especially important in this has been the study of rebellions in other places, including Vince's landmark book on Tacky's War and the Broader Rebellion in Jamaica. And thanks to fine work on that, we have a much clearer sense of the specifics of the area around Southampton County. But still, for all the valuable scholarship on the area and on slave rebellions more generally, there are three central aspects of his life that Tony aimed to catch as he conveyed his view of his book as he was in his last years to me. His life as a Methodist, as a prophet, and as a general. One section of the Confessions describes a childhood in the Methodist faith. And you see here in the uh, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History, amazing museum on the mall, a Bible um, that is uh, believed to have belonged to Nat, that was passed along as if it were Nat's. And you see it, this sort of worn Bible that he knew and he read. Um, and one section of the Confessions describes an extraordinary childhood um, in the Methodist faith. In that childhood, we have a strong sense of the ways that this evangelical revivals, Baptists, Methodists, and some others, had moved powerfully through these back country, precisely because there were so few of the Anglican priests and parishes that dominated the eastern seaboard, moving through both white and black communities. In the book, Nat, uh, Thomas Gray quotes Nat, describing his mother, his grandmother, teaching him about the Bible, his participation, his absorption in prayer meetings. These were biracial meetings held first in the Turner's living room, then in a church they built. And in reading and rereading the Bible, a work he came to know well, to quote from, to pattern his life after, to sing songs based on. And in these songs, he, they often sang about the end of the world, of this relay of the prophecies of the Old Testament and Hebrew Bible to the book of Revelation, and a martial imagery that ran through this moment of evangelicalism. They also discuss prophet. Nat being a prophet, Nat was called a prophet repeatedly in his lifetime. In the weeks between the attacks, people referred to him, between the attacks and his surrender, people referred to him that way as a prophet out there. And when Gray interviewed Nat shortly before the trial, Gray interrupted him, uh, his tale to say when Nat referred to the spirit, he said, what do you mean by the spirit? And Nat said, the spirit that broke to the prophet, broke the, that spoke to the prophets in formal days. What did it mean to be a prophet in this period? Tony wrestled with this question. He read biographies of the dozens, hundreds of people in the period who walked around speaking of prophecy, not just as an inspirational leader, not just as someone who spoke about the future, but as someone who believed that they received language directly from God, open direct revelation. And the number of people, black and white, some famous, Joseph Smith, you know, you know probably most famous, influenced by Methodism, the former Baptist William Miller, but also Jarena Lee of many people, white and black, who said God appeared to them. What was it about this moment that made this seem urgent and necessary and, danger and dangerous? And what was it about this moment that also heightened the constant contradictions and the constant cruelty of slavery? Because Methodism brought hope for an end to slavery. Some of the other white turners had listened to the, the messages that itinerant preachers in the Methodist faith had delivered, saying slavery was wrong and had begun to free people, but not the turners who owned Nat and his family. And in this context, we see uh, Nat as he wrestles with the fact that he will not be freed and that his parents, his parents wrestle with it. And we also see him, and this is one of the great interventions of Vince's book, as a general, of slave rebellions as wars, not just as ideologies, not just as motivated by personal desire, but as wars. And what it meant for him to think and to act as a, as a warrior who was studying, who was trying to understand other wars. And finally, what we see in this is a sense of Nat's own wrestling with doubt. But I think possibly the most brilliant among the many things that Tony conveyed was the sense that Nat was a person who took, who spoke of certainty, but whose life revealed a series of doubts. It was nine years from the first of the revelations of the Spirit until he acted. In his words, he narrates this as a time of certainty. And yet he also asks why 
Why me? Why now? Can I get one more confirmation? And here Tony looked to the world and to the work of the Hebrew Bible, of other contemporary prophets, of the way to understand that to be a prophet is to live in, is to act in faith and live in doubt. We can see here the map of the places that Nat moved, and it's hard to reproduce on this size screen, as he moved through and this ultimate goal of his to reach Jerusalem and to ease his doubts by waiting, getting there and calling for God to reveal the next stage, whether glorious or terrible or both. And we can see the ways that as this spread across the world, it was, it was reproduced in horrific terms. But we can also see the ways that this has been reproduced and recreated generation after generation to find the aspects that are beautiful and hopeful, even as we can't shy from the aspects that we might find, you know, in you know, a struggle to deal with. One of the ones I most admire is this recent story quilt series by Baltimore artist Stephen Towns. And I admire it because it's beautiful, uh, as we should admire art. And I also admire it for the ways that Towns wrestling quite recently and making that visible to new generations of people as an inspiration, as a guide, with the varieties of, of moments of Nat's life, of him with his mother, of capturing, yes, Nat as warrior, yes, Nat as prophet, but also Nat as human in a way that's very difficult to do for a historian because of the gaps in his biography, a gap that goes so far as to say we don't know that he called himself Nat Turner. He's referred to that in his lifetime by some white people, but not even all white people. And while that name was affixed to him eventually by sympathizers as a way to give homage and respect, we genuinely don't know if he would have called himself that. And we know very little about the person Towns pictured in the right corner, his wife, probably named Cherry. And so I admire this and the tools that, ta that Towns has and others have as artists to try and capture what we can't know. But I want to close with this. One of Tony's oldest and dearest friends, Michael West, wrote to me as he read the draft of the book to say that over decades of journalism and activism and intellectual life, Tony always wrestled with a question that troubled him. How do people find hope in a hopeless world? Real hope, meaningful hope, not easy, casual, dismissive hope. Tony worried about this as a young person in the 70s and 80s. He worried when he looked for inspiration in older activist intellectuals who, who kept hope alive in periods of McCarthyism, who saw the limits of rational reason, of reason for hope, and kept to it anyway. And he worried about it in his own time, which was our own time. How and why should people have hope? For Tony, who was a secular person, he was fascinated by the ways that Nat found hope and the distance between how Tony saw the world and how he believed Nat saw the world inspired him with curiosity. He didn't write it to discover who he was. He wrote it to discover a way of finding hope that I think in the end he did not share. For me personally, keeping Tony's work alive was itself a project of hope of hope that the profession of history under attack in many ways could be sustained as a project of collective endeavor, not just me um, and not just Tony, uh, but Vince will join us in just a second, and of the dozens, hundreds, thousands of other people, tens of thousands of other people doing history in one way or another, learning from each other, making something bigger than me or than him, but that's made when we learn from the work of others and seek to sharpen it through our own imperfections and curiosities and hand it to others to sharpen it and also to leave it in, the, in imperfect hands as we all do, but to keep it going on. And your presence here is a sign to me of hope, of real hope, a belief in our ability, of our curiosity to guide us into worlds different from our own and back into our own, a warrior for the first time of its contours and determined to find ways to change it. So I'm really honored to be here, and I'm honored to be here with Vincent Brown, um, a fantastic historian, uh, who's now going to uh, moderate the next section of our discussion. Well, thank you very much, Greg. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, I learned a lot just in these last 20 minutes or so. Um, I want to thank you also for taking up this work. Um, congratulate you, of course, for the publication of this fantastic book, but also thank you for carrying on Tony's work. Tony's work, uh, especially in joining places, was very uh, important to me. It was an inspiration to my own 
thinking about space in my work on slavery and slave revolt. Uh, and it's great to see his work carried on this way so that his perspective on the history that we are all interested in can live on. Um, I think that's very important. Um, so, so I want to commend you for that. It's especially difficult to take up someone else's work to make it your own as you have to in order to finish it, but to still make sure the inspiration of that creator comes through. And I feel like you've done that marvelously with this work. And it's 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 a real achievement. And I, and, and, and I'm, I, I congratulate you again. Um, I think it's fair to say that the story of Nat, we often know it as the story of Nat Turner, is often told, as you say, Nat is one of the most famous enslaved persons in American history and certainly the most famous uh, uh, slave rebel often told, but not widely known, right? And that may at once sound like a contradiction, but I think you understand what I'm getting at, which is it's a story we have to tell over and over and over again. It's one of our most oft-repeated stories, but it's not a story that, that sticks with us as a fundamental part of our understanding of American history um, and the journey that we've been on as Americans in this country. Why do you think that is, if, if in fact you think I'm right? Yeah, that's a great question. I do want to also say that I'm sure he conveyed this to you, but um, your work was a beacon to Tony's and 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 what he often invoked as he thought about how his own thinking on enslaved rebellions um, had been changed by the ways that that you approached it and the ways that you crossed lines within the in the discipline. And I'm thank sure you. That that means a lot to me, actually. I'm sure, it would mean a lot to him to have heard what you said. Um, and I also appreciate the way you have a, a framing it. I'm not the uh, you know I'm trying to bring him to fruition, and I'm not also it is uh, while I had to invest in it to do it. It is. I'm not the co-author of it. I hope it's it's really his. It's it's as close to his book as I could could get or imagine. I think your question is a really important one. Um, and I can imagine lots of differences, certainly strong views. And we got some questions about this of Nat have circulated, especially in Southside Virginia, um, you know, for, you know, probably, you know, really ever since for almost two centuries. Uh, you know, of course, it's impossible to diagnose exactly, you know, to track, you know, year by year through the 19th and early 20th century. Um, but there remain strong views, some of which are not, you know, completely in alignment, you know, with the the views that I presented of Tony's, um, including contrary views of who Nat's family was, uh, and there's alternative views of his of his uh, of his family, some of which, uh, you know, different views that exist in, in the region. Um, and it is clear that it circulated and it meant something to people, you know, that there was claims that um, that black Southsiders dated time from Nat's rebellion or that they called the Civil War the second war with Nat's as the first. That when uh, Baptist churches brought into an associate uh, black Baptist association from the South Side from Southampton County. Um, in 1867, they're welcomed for their representation of the region made famous by Nat. When Indianapolis Freeman does a poll of African Americans, Nat receives a lot of votes. But this, I think, might start us toward the answer to your question. He's not included in the list. Um, and there's this sense in which he exists as a figure of awe and mystery and danger. And that makes him unavoidable. It's why everybody needs to come back to him. And yet it's troubling enough that he can't ever be quite kept hold of, right? Compared to other eminent figures who are always remembered, and yet it takes a lot of work to tell us what do we you know, need to do, the work, say, David Blight did to say, here's what we need to do to know more about Frederick Douglass other than the part that's caught in our head, or the incredible work Taya Miles did on, on Harriet Tubman. Nat can sit in a different ways precisely because his heroism is more troubling, uh, at mm -hmm. least to some people, certainly to white people. But it seems like even to some of the Indianapolis Freeman, there's some, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and others because of the embrace of violence. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, you know, that Nat takes on resonance at moments when the hope for peaceful change or ameliorative change or reformist change accomplishing enough seems to be diminished as a reminder of the repertoire that, you know, exists of human behavior. 
And also for that reason, when there seemed to be some hope for smaller ameliorative reformist change, Nat can sit really uneasily in this as a kind can of- Can I push you a little bit on that? Go because I agree with you, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't seem to bother us that say the re violence is part of the repertoire of a George Washington, <laughs> right? Okay. Or, or an Andrew Jackson. Yeah. Um, that seems to be acknowledged as something that's part of their character. They were men of their times. I wonder why we have so much more trouble acknowledging that violence would have been part of the repertoire for enslaved people. That's a great question. And it raises the really crucial part that I, that I under, you know, that I had, you know, bypassed, which is do we, you know, to what degree do different Americans understand, truly understand, not as a slogan, slavery as a war mm. and the effort to end slavery as a war. And that the ways that it seems that we excuse the violence that people do face, now there's part of it of which just silence and amnesia, say around how Jackson treated people, you know, treated enslaved people. But then in wartime, we create these exceptions mm -hmm. that in the U.S. popular, mostly white imagination, it's difficult to see that kind of extension to uh, rebels who fight absent wartime, absent mm -hmm. this sort of formal wartime. Um, in my perception, you'd be the person, you know, who'd be much better placed to answer this than I do, than I am. But when I talk to students about it, I show the ways that enslaved rebels uh, are celebrated in other countries as heroic figures in a way that's really hard to see um, in the U.S. And even a very recent effort to put his name as a famous, you know, Black Virginian was the only person who received pushback. Um, that, you know, forget about the sort of, you know, uh, you know a statue of him brandishing a, a fence post or something. Um, it's, it's very, it touches a nerve that um, seems distinctly American about not being willing to see slavery as war and slave rebellions as wars, as opposed to- I think that 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 is a good explanation of why Nat remains a troublesome property. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanna shift a little bit to, to Tony's vision of, of Nat um, and ask you why you thought it was so important that he teach us to see Nat as a Methodist as a prophet and as a general who had some serious doubts about his mission in the world. I mean, where did Tony get that inspiration? Because lots of people in reading the, the certainly the Thomas Gray narrative, lots of people have been invested and interested in this story, but Tony really has hit on something new here, I think, with the representation of Nat. And I wanna, I wanna tease out where you think that inspiration came from. Yeah, I mean, um, the, I mean, I think at one level, it came from the purity of his sense of himself as a historian. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, as I said, he came into it believing he was going to write about geography. And then as he wrestled more and more with it, it's unavoidable, the religiosity of the text. Everybody mentions that you can't talk about him without mentioning it. Mm -hmm. And yet it's easy to compartmentalize it. And he got interested in the ways that his own shortcuts that, you know, he shared with other historians of put in a revolutionary framework, you know, that sort of arcs it in this way. Or, you know, look toward personal explanations, you know, which has been unavoidable for some scholars and also writers. Um, or find these things that how difficult it was to keep centered how Nat seemed, if you take the confession seriously, to present himself what it meant to take that seriously. So I think, it, you know, a part of it was just the historian facing stubborn, not quite facts, but aspects, sources, and that didn't comport with the way he started and having that sense of curiosity and of the mm. largeness of spirit to say, what am I missing? Over time, he got really interested in the historicity of the revolts of this period and mm. what we lost if we just put them into an age of Atlantic revolution. Um, and what we lost, he thought, was the ways they conceived of time and place and of change. And that he came to believe that, you know, scholars struggled to attribute real meaning to religious belief to treat it as an effect, treat it as a literary or intellectual device. And that this revealed a gap between the ways that even religious 21st century people understood the world and the way that 19th century people understood the world. And that to try and understand them in their context demanded it. 
That's great. I want to move to some of the questions from from our audience. So we've got some fantastic ones. Um, one of my favorites is actually comes from from Tony's widow. Um, and, you know, we have not with a vision of what he must do, even though he doubts it for nine years and doesn't finally, you know, put that vision into execution for some time. Um, if we think about the 19th century as a place where many people receive visions, if we think about kind of th that, that maybe this wasn't a unique vision to Nat Turner or people that would have received other kinds of visions, if he hadn't acted on it, do you think somebody else might have? I know it's a counterfactual, but I just I just would like to hear you speculate on that. Yeah. Well, I think, hi, Melissa, it's a great question. I'm glad uh, that Vince pulled it. And I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. I uh, wish I, you know, had, you know, the ability to, to ask Tony, you know, his view, because that would be my first goal to reproduce that if I can. Um, I think there are certainly fantastic scholars who have and are wrestling with that. Alan Taylor right now is working on a study of a, of a neighboring, uh, not in Southampton, but a plantation in a neighboring county um, that has led him to be curious about whether there actually was a broader, not just could there have been, but was there a broader um, plan or at least set of, if not planned, set of inspirations. Um, mm -hmm. And if Nat is responding at part to these changes in the natural world, how did other people respond? to them. So that's certainly a powerful question. I think that it is, you know, inherent in the nature of chattel slavery to want to rebel um, mm -hmm. and to look for times and avenues to rebel. And that the, you know, certainly lots of people, you know, there had been lots of other rebellions that he probably saw himself in line with those and that other people and other rebellions saw themselves in line with him. And I think in the U.S. South, especially in areas like Southside, where there were large white populations, people also always calculated, why should I hope? Mm. And that the demographics and the, and the amount of weapons that white people have, the number of white people, which is something that a enslaved person tells them as they go along, says, I've been to Norfolk and you have no idea how many white people there are. And immediately a few people leave. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you how do you grab hold of hope? And it seems to me that in this period, that as hope of some kind of alliance with the British or French was fading, that this turn toward a hope seen in the Vesey testimony um, and elsewhere of a hope from external deliverance. So I think so. But I don't think Nat was the only and Nat was very unusual. I don't think he'd be the only person to look for that hope from above. I was just going to say, you know, one of our one of our guests asked would you see John Brown in the same light? Yeah. Well, Brown is a fascinating figure. And as you probably know, they're, they're twinned in some ways, right? That Du Bois was fascinated by Nat Turner, got asked instead to write about John Brown and sort of wrote about Brown as a way of writing about Turner. Um, and there are fascinating, you know, connections, um, you know, including the religiosity, the Brown's religiosity, you know, has been usually described as more congregationalist, sort of seen as old fashioned, whereas Nat, for his time period and his evangelicism, was seen as a unusually strong devotee of a, of a sort of more normative process. The other thing I think Brown really was a constitutionalist, right? He wrote a constitution. He didn't love the U.S. Constitution, but he believed in Republican governance. Um, he just believed it was going to take violence to create a accurately, you know, Republican, Republican governance. I think it's an open question whether that's true of Nat and whether Nat had that kind of secular vision of what kind of country it could be, as opposed to a vision as he had seen. If he saw Christ crucified in the sky, was he seeing the signs of the end of the world? Mm, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. You know, I just wonder if you have, you know, say one kind of popular myth about Nat that you think is most important to dispel or that Tony thought would be most important to dispel. Yeah, yeah. Given, well, given that, you know, as, again, we, 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 we know his name. Right. But we may not know so much about him as, as this book is going to teach us. So I think there's a, you know, a, a, an important one and then maybe one that's a little more uh, trivial. The important mm -hmm. one is the idea, certainly popularized by Styron and others, that we had to look for some deeply personal, especially psychosexual, you know, explanation for it. To me, the problem with that is not just that it doesn't fit what we know about Nat, that that's the most important problem. But it's what it suggests about the inability to imagine slavery. Mm. I think there's something really profound. I mean, obviously, it could come from other motives, but there's something really profound about him saying, Travis is not so bad. 
and also I killed him because he was a slave owner. Right. And the profundity of that is it reminds us that treatment on any scale didn't change the fact of being enslaved and the ways he could be separated from his family. I think that's just our inability to understand, I don't want to say totality, uh, but the sort of scope of slavery and the way. Would you, would you talk very briefly about just what was going on with the internal domestic slave trade in yeah. the United States at this point? Because I think a lot of people have an image of the slave trade that's mostly the transatlantic slave trade. Right. And it's not well known that, you know, the, the North American part of the transatlantic slave trade was relatively small compared to the transatlantic slave trade to Brazil or the Caribbean. But the domestic slave trade in those four or five decades before the Civil War, you had a million people moving, being separated from their families, moving to these new territories to the West that were opening for cultivation as uh, the United States was moving Native Americans off of their land. Would you just kind of talk about what that meant as a context for slavery for someone like Nat in the 1830s? Well, this constant, you're absolutely right, right? What Ira Berlin called the second middle passage, right? About a million people from the Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River. Yeah, uh, you know, Valley. Um, and the ways that, you know, probably, though we can't say with certainty, his own family had been disrupted as some white turners moved some, and certainly the networks that had existed on the eastern shore of, uh, of Virginia were broken up as people moved even as close as Southampton. And Virginia, as you know very well, became an exporter of, of human beings. Mm. But as tobacco declined, and as you say, as the evictions and expulsions and, you know, under military force of the Cherokee, the Muskegee, and many others opened up these lands, Virginians got wealthy selling people away, not just because as a disciplinary action, though sometimes that happened, but also as a pure financial trade. And I mm. think this really hangs over. Um, the lives of many people, not just the pain they experience right around them, but this possibility of separation that they cannot, that they don't understand how they'd be able to undo. Mm -hmm. And he and had so, taken, yeah, and, and at the same time, uh, as, as Tony and you write, many are turning to the Bible. Yeah. Um, and there's a question that comes from the chat that I'm fascinated by too, which is whether or not Nat's Bible was complete. Oh, when it was found missing because you know there were these bibles for slaves yes. that were incomplete because the bible was a dangerous book a threatening yeah, right. book right yeah. um what was the nature of of nat's bible and you know what what was not there for nat to read do you know that's a great question i don't know the details of the of that i'd like i mean i don't believe it was found in complete form but i think that was because of but uh, but i want to be cautious of over speaking and certainly those become popular though often a little bit later there's a wave of pro-slavery preaching in mm. some ways inspired by nat as a way of you know turn domesticating christianity and uh and domesticating uh, the evangelical impulse. Um, he seems to have certainly no shortage of words at hand uh, to describe it. And it's interesting in Charleston, now Denmark Vesey was free, but that the enslaved people seem to know quite a lot about it. Though it's also interesting, as, as you know, in, in the um, uh, revolt in Demerara, um, mm. that they hear a passage that they haven't heard about rebellion. And one of the things they do is they capture a white preacher and say, why didn't you preach to us about this? Uh, and I yeah. don't know if it's that the Bibles they had didn't have it or if the literacy is the key component, right? Okay, that's great. We have, we have, so we have evidence that the, the Bible was a dangerous book. And I guess my last question, and you can answer this quickly um, because I know we want to have you read uh, some of your marvelous book. Um, is this a dangerous book? That Tony, <laughs> you have written. I mean, we see across the country there are new bans on different books, especially books having to do with Black history. Um, we know that it's a challenging subject for many people. We know that there's a criticism of what people are calling an oppressed oppressor framework. I guess, you know, the story of Nat Turner would fit into that. Um, do you have any sense that this book is dangerous in that way, that, you know, you might run into trouble? Um, as you as you begin to promote this book, sell this book, and talk about this book across the country, just what are your what are your thoughts on the current moment in in writing Black history and teaching Black history? 
That's a great question. I'm teaching in California, and uh, and as you know, the area and the system well, we have other things to answer for, but we're well insulated on that front. There you go. We're well insulated on, on that front. Um, and and I find it dangerous in the, in the in the good way that it's meant to disrupt our certainties. And I think that it's meant to, you know, I have a number of people when I said, oh, I'm writing about a, a slave rebel and they say, oh, exciting, that's great. And you say, Nat Turner, these are mostly white liberal people. And they sort of panic, right? Because of the things it forces them to confront, right? The brutality of the system, but also his, you know, the tools that he turned to. Um, so in that way, you know, to the degree it's disruptive, that's a kind of danger that, you know, I, I would welcome. On the other side, I feel like, um, you know, everything that we do is a dangerous book for, you know, could be, you know, for some of the people who are trying to lay down these regulations, some of which are, you know, uh, that a book not disturb people. Well, I, I don't know what that means, right? I remember being at a, at a conference with Crystal Feimster at Yale, and they said, um, you know, what do you feel when people say you shouldn't talk about the, the violence of this? And she said something, I'm not going to get her quote right, but, but what's left of American history if we take the violence out? Mm -hmm. um, and so I could see that. And also, I think almost everything that any of us write and teach by those lights, it's meant to disturb people. It's meant to shake them up. It's meant to get yeah. them to think, and that's what frustrates me, that people think we're indoctrinating. I can't even tell my kids when to go to go to school how they think our students are going to, you know, obey our indoctrination, but it is <laughs> meant to shake them up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for this conversation. I know you want to read something from, from this book, um, and I just want to thank you for this conversation. Thank uh, uh, our guests uh, um, for sending their questions through. Yes, thank you both, and thank you, Thank you, Vince and Greg, for this really eye-opening discussion. It is such rich, multi-dimensional history that you're sharing. Um, we have all learned a tremendous amount, and there's more to come. Uh, as we do for all our authors in the American Inspiration series, we've asked Greg to do a final reading from his book. So um, back to you for that, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. It's really been an honor to uh, share the screen with you. And thank you to uh, everyone, everyone here. I'm reading from the end of chapter um, eight. And this is as Gray is talking to Nat or narrating himself talking to Nat in, in jail in Southampton as he awaits his trial, which he knows will lead to his death penalty unless there is divine intervention. Perhaps nothing in their exchange remains quite so challenging to contemplate as a moment when Gray apparently interrupted Nat. Nat was in the middle of describing one of his most vivid encounters with the spirit, the moment the spirit told him that the serpent was loosened and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent, for the time was fast approaching when the first should be last and the last should be first. In the middle of perhaps the most extraordinary of Nat's many amazing statements, Gray intervened, not with a request for more information, but with doubt that a skeptic like Gray, who I say earlier was atheist, must have found overpowering, even more so as he came to admire Nat's intelligence. Do you not find yourself mistaken now, Gray asked. Perhaps he gestured to their drab surroundings in jail. Nat sat in front of him in rags, possibly chained, his compatriots mostly dead, his cause silence. The import of Gray's words was obvious. If Nat was favored by God, where were the signs? Was the last first last? Was the last first? And so Nat answered according to Gray was not Christ crucified. This fallen world would murder a prophet as the Hebrew Bible recounted the ancient murdering of those prophets. As Jesus' world murdered him, Nat was not casting himself as the Messiah, but typing his life after the models he knew. Sometimes God rewarded prophets with victory, but evil always rose up against faithfulness, at least until the end of the world. Why precisely should Nat expect this evil world to permit him to live when the world had crushed so many virtuous prophets before him? If the atheistic Gray was troubled by this line of inquiry, he did not say so. But it is a question that has troubled the memory of Nat since 1831, and it is a question that should trouble us still. Uh, so thank you, Greg, for this remarkable work, and Professor Kay as well, and, uh, and Vince, you are a remarkable moderator. We feel tremendously lucky. Um, we honor Professor Kay's memory and his research with tonight, and uh, you will go forward in that. Um, thank you so much, Greg, for your work. Thanks for joining us.